Hello, my name is Nathaniel Osgood. Within this presentation, it's my great pleasure to be able to discuss with you hybrid dynamic modeling techniques, particularly highlighting a few patterns that I believe make this technique highly compelling in the use of the um, application of system science methods to help. The origins of this uh, presentation reflect my uh, quarter century of, of modeling techniques of exploring modeling applications, particularly in health, using a variety of different modeling, dynamic modeling techniques, um, uh, agent-based modeling, discrete event modeling, and uh, very importantly, system dynamics modeling. Uh, within this presentation, I'm going to be characterizing uh, why I believe hybrid dynamic modeling techniques offer uh, such, a, such a key place within the modeling ecosystem and why I believe, reflective of, of system science principles, um, they offer a situation where when bringing together two or more math dy dynamic modeling methods to address a problem, you can get a result where the value conferred by the entire model um, is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, the value delivered by that model uh, exceeds the value that would be delivered by any given method in isolation, or even the sum of the, the um, values that will be delivered by uh, approaching this problem in two different ways or three different ways. So within this presentation, um, I'm going to be discussing the combination of three very popular system science techniques that I've mentioned, agent-based modeling, discrete event modeling, and system dynamics modeling. Now the opening reflection of this is again reflective of um, my decades of experience in combining all three techniques. And it really um, boils down to the conviction that system science methodologies uh, are distinctive and highly complementary. Um, in, in understanding different uh, system science techniques, uh, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, for example, it's, it's very easy to um, get caught up in, in differences in the formalisms, difference in the way they represent a situation. Um, often what um, distinguishes these methodologies most fundamentally is uh, the different types of questions they seek to answer, um, the, different, um, the different types of goals that they're, that they're um, seeking to reach using the modeling. Uh, and no one system science methodology, it turns out, offers a complete replacement to the others. There are certain areas within um, application space where a given methodology will offer um, completely compelling um, value relative to the others. But in other areas, um, that particular methodology may be um, uh, less advantageous to pursue than, than another. It's, um, it's my observation that significant synergies can be secured by using combinations of techniques to address the same problem, either in a, a serial or parallel way with different models, building, for example, a system dynamics model for high-level characterization up front to do some basic formal analysis and then diving into an agent-based characterization, um, or indeed maintaining uh, separate model modeling lines of development, each probing different sides of the issues and, and dealing with different states, sets of stakeholders. Um, however, uh, within this presentation, we'll be concentrating on situations where within the same model, under the same roof as it were, we have several different methodologies operating in parallel and interacting within, with each other. Why would you pursue this sort of hybrid modeling approach? It sounds uh, to, the, to someone who's never pursued it before as, as a fair bit of work. Perhaps something that um, for some of you was intellectually intriguing, but there's a real question, does it confer um, real practical uh, value? Does it have uh, a, a real place in, in sort of the pragmatic modeler's toolbox? And the answer, I think, is quite emphatically yes, based on a diverse set of, of um, hybrid modeling techniques we've been pursuing for, um, for about eight years now. And um, I've listed some of the key motivations that I believe uh, play a role in selecting um, use of, of hybrid modeling techniques. One is the fact uh, that I've mentioned already that certain of these techniques have a high, confer a high degree of comparative advantage in certain 
sub areas of modeling. Um, it may be uh, in our case that we can more easily represent certain dynamics or certain interventions that we need to simulate in a health uh, model uh, easier in one framework uh, than another. Um, <clears throat> system dynamics models offer um, really compelling advantages relative to other techniques in certain um, certain contexts. Uh, for example, having a, a, a formal mechanism that's amenable to very powerful analyses to demonstrate uh, equilibria or, or um, the stability of those equilibria, to identify the long-term behavior of a system, to reason about a system's behavior under a wide variety of different parameter values. Um, they can also offer compelling value in dealing with certain types of stakeholders and even with in, deal, in dealing with uh, community groups, for example, for a first time using a simple, graphical, easy-to-use mechanism. Um, uh, they can also be used that, to understand certain high-level uh, dynamics, um, uh, which are characterized in an aggregate fashion um, in a way that's quite crisp and, and boils it down to some simple feedback. Uh, Agent-based modeling offers, uh, in, and in general, uh, individual-based modeling offers really compelling advantages in certain uh, subdomains. If we want to represent agent decision-making based on um, heterogeneous preferences within the population, preferences that reflect um, a given, say, person's um, uh, situated context within a, um, a spatial or, or topological environment within a network, represents their limited social capital in that region of the network, or, or um, uh, the, the peculiarities of their, um, of their geographic uh, position, the accessibility of resources to them within that position, for example. If we're seeking to, to represent um, disparities, heterogeneity is front and center. Um, if we're seeking to, to understand agent history, we need to keep track of, of um, how a, a later person's life trajectory might be affected by early life insults or, or by their uh, their birth weight or, or aspects of their in utero exposure, say for epigenetic factors. Um, these are, are compelling reasons that an individual-based characterization can offer a great deal of value. And naturally, if we want to calibrate against data, which is longitudinal in character at an individual level, or if we wish to, um, if we wish to reason about the impacts of interventions, which um, uh, depend on, on that agent's history, say, of episodes of care. Agent-based models um, or individual-based models, including most notably agent-based models as an instantiation, offer truly compelling value. Discrete event modeling has enormous compelling um, uh, advantages um, when, when we're dealing with resource-constrained processes. I'm using that term in its, its common sense, discrete event modeling, um, unfortunately, it does characterize, um, use colloquially a much broader set of models, but um, I'm using it to represent process-centric modeling, as has been applied extensively for representing, say, certain health, health service contexts. Um, here, if we have resource-constrained processing of, of individuals, say, of patients, these entities that flow through the system, present for care, are routed based on their, their characteristics, um, based on, on um, the availability of resources that are queued up um, and, and await availability, say, of, of procedure rooms or nurses or doctors, um, specialists of certain types per, um, of, of uh, diagnostic equipment, um, operating theaters. These are really compelling um, advantages where discrete event modeling, and again, using that in a, in a technical um, specific sense, narrower sense of the world, really shines and, and offers tremendous uh, concision, conciseness of representation, transparency, uh, visual understandability um, uh, that, that can be very, uh, very compelling and permit interaction with stakeholders uh, in a rich way. Uh, another need is those different analysis needs uh, across, across different components of the model, the questions the availability of data, the priorities um, of representing certain areas of the model, levels of interest, and I would note the stakeholders can vary across regions of a system. For, for regions of our, of our model and our 
and the system it represents that are more clinically focused. We may be dealing with uh, clinicians who have very strong interest in understanding the impact uh, uh, trajectories of particular individuals over multiple episodes of care. In other cases, we may have only rough data on the broader population, um, and we may wish to, and that may not be central to the um, to the purpose of the model um, compared to a, a focal group of at-risk individuals. In other cases, um, we have an issue of, of um, needing flexibility within our modeling. This is an underappreciated app, um, uh, sort of motivation for for hybrid modeling. <clears throat> we have a need to not only um, have the option of, of representing different regions of our model with different modeling methodologies, but very importantly, given that that models are learning tools, or as my colleague Jeff McDonald talks about them, learning prostheses, um, a central focus is learning from the model. And as we learn, we may seek we may recognize um, uh, the desirability of changing the scope of our model, evolving the boundary between different representations um, uh, to reflect our, our growing understanding of which areas of model merit um, more detailed investigation. And having a hybrid modeling um, uh, framework and, and, and um, approach permits you to adjust those boundaries in a fine-grained way it's really powerful. If you discover through sensitivity analyses or um, uh, preliminary model, model results in simulating interventions, that certain sub-areas of model um, or types of interventions require greater examination, you, you can deepen the level of detail, say by um, individuating, by turning that region of the model into an individual-based model, uh, as, as you need to capture, say, history information individual uh, preferences, heterogeneity, um, uh, in a way that, that might help you understand transfer effects. Very, very important um, type of flexibility. Flexibility offers value, and um, having the ability to adapt that, that um, boundary uh, can be profoundly helpful as the modeling process uh, uh, evolves. Another issue is that different sets of stakeholders will resonate with different components, uh, different representations from a model. We may be dealing with, with demographers um, in representing um, dynamics of population, um, uh, population age and, and, and sex and ethnicity structure. And there they may be very, very comfortable, in fact, most conversant with, a, say, a stock and flow representation. By contrast, if we're dealing with um, clinical level features or, or with case workers um, who really um, understand uh, and, and um, speak in the language of and, uh, and parse and resonate with individual level representations, that can be a motivation for representing things at an individual level. An, an agent-based or individual level representation of a model need not be inherently more complex than an aggregate representation. Indeed, there are times where capturing a given dynamics can be easier at the individual level. And often, um, if we can characterize that individual level model in a transparent fashion, increasingly possible, um, we can interact with those stakeholders in a way that will be much more familiar and much more comfortable and, frankly, much more likely to secure their, their, um, their buy-in at an individual level representation. Um, uh, so different regions of model have different stakeholders and, and different needs, perhaps, in terms of representing representation that reflect that. Another real important component that we found quite important in our work is computational efficiency. Um, it's all very uh, well and good to, to think about, say, uh, an individual level representation of a, of a country's population, but, but that involves uh, quite a, um, a major um, computational degree of burden. And, and often our needs um, are not uniform across different subsegments of that population. And we may see computational efficiencies in areas where our representational needs or level of detail is not as great. 
we really wish to represent, say, this population in, in, in interventions in a way that can allow for interactive experimentation. And an individual level representation is, is just not going to, uh, to cut it for the entire population. As a result, we may um, characterize a broader population within a within a um, an aggregate type fashion, and the down and uh, population at risk or um, uh, who are at high risk may be represented at an individual level. A final need is multi-scale modeling cases where the the dynamics um, at a micro level may be entangled at successive levels of scale. Um, whether it's uh, propagation of, of cancers from lower level mutations resulting from environmental exposures that ripple up to, to um, patterns of, of clinical presentation and path, clinical pathways rippling up to, to population wide effects um, in terms of the burden of, of, of say, cancer. Um, or uh, fa other factors, say, immunologically at the the micro level reflecting um, buildup of um, of uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes um, uh, activation of uh, such lymphocytes in, in contact with antigen etc uh, going up to the level of, of again population burden of a, of a communicable illness often we're interested in these multiple scales and and um, behavior at, at, at one scale, we may be comfortable representing in one framework, say immunological dynamics with a system dynamics model, um, where it characterizes stocks of, of um, homogeneous cytotoxic T lymphocytes for cell mediated immunity, all the way up to um, clinical pathways, which are represent discrete event modeling, to, to a high level um, uh, representations of population health and in, in either an agent-based or, or system dynamics fashion. So in light of these, these needs um, that I've just enumerated that, that we found in, in our work, I'd like to talk about five patterns of use of hybrid health modeling that I find uh, particularly uh, compelling. Um, the first of these involves a situation where we have um, an interaction between a population on the one hand and a health service on the other. Um, now, I'm going to go through each of these uh, compelling patterns first and, and just give a glimpse of it, and then we're going to go into each in more detail and talk about why each component of it um, uh, is, is so critical and, and why they can't operate in isolation. Um, what is it that, the, that combining them, why is the whole greater than the sum of the parts, as it were? Um, in this case, though, uh, this particular case, service population interaction, we have this kind of catchment basin for, for health service facilities. Um, um, and we have uh, individuals' uh, health evolving in the population. And at some point, um, that may reach a point where, uh, due to symptomology, um, uh, due to um, uh, norms uh, associated in their social networks, they present for care. And the presentation for care goes on in a, in a context which captures a resource-centric fashion where um, that individual who remains in the population is flowing additionally through a care process which keeps track of their uh, progress. Now, this may be progress within a facility say within the course of a, of a day, someone presenting for care in an emergency room, or it may be their, their um, presentation through, say, um, um, through a, a mental health um, and support unit um, set of care processes uh, for returning veterans. Um, here we have this care process, which may be very uh, defined and which critically um, their flow depends on availability of resources. So they flow through this um, clinical care pathway uh, over time, and, and their uh, flow is governed by resources. And we can examine the impact of resource availability, for example, on the health of the population, or trends in population health on demand for resources. We could examine how innovations in the clinical care pathways can end up um, leading to um, improved health within the population. We can characterize this as well 
um, by characterizing actually uh, mobility-based um, movement and presentation to facilities where individuals present for, for care in the course of their, um, uh, their, their movements in a way that reflects their geographic position, for example. Um, and in their activity spaces, the, the accessibility of clinics to, to um, their region um, the, reflects uh, transportation networks. And each clinic is characterized in, in discrete event, um, classic discrete event uh, fashion. Going on again in my quick sweep here <clears throat> to the next component, um, another compelling pattern is where we have an individual at-risk population, um, which uh, is represented at a very, very detailed model, but enmeshed in a broader aggregate population. The idea here is that we have a um, excuse me um, we have a uh, a population which is uh, a focal interest. It's an at risk or high risk population, and individuals in a general population, perhaps at lower levels of risk, are characterized in an aggregate fashion. But once they reach a certain level of of risk in the risk continuum, they're individuated. They're rendered as as agents um with with uh, all the the benefits um that it, that an individual level representation confers we can capture their spatial location their ge uh, uh, geographic location for example uh and as much as it governs availability of resources we can capture the position in networks we can capture individual episodes of care um of this at risk or high risk population we can capture um, uh, interventions that really end up affecting individuals according to their preferences or according to those previous characteristics I've mentioned. Um, and uh, this, this affords us a tremendous um, economies of, of computation because we can represent the, the broader population at a very coarse-grained level while still securing us uh, the, the tremendous detail we may need to simulate uh, targeted interventions, interventions targeted at a particular population subgroups um, to understand the, the transfer effects from one segment of the population to another um, that results from our intervention in a way that um, it would, would not be possible or would be um, highly, highly awkward in an aggregate type representation, even with the sort of um, uh, very um, very sort of broad brushed and uh, blunt instrument of, of stratif model stratification. Um, so at an individual level, we can characterize our, our focal population of interest, exquisite levels of detail, while still securing tremendous economies in terms of simulation, permitting perhaps a, um, a um, uh, type of simulation like this to be um, uh, investigated and explored interactively by our stakeholders or by ourselves at that tight learning loop that um, uh, recommends so many, um, say, system dynamics models, um, but can also extend to this uh, hybrid context. Again, continuing my, my broad sweep um, here, a, um, a further representation that we found very compelling is where we have system dynamics ele uh, elements within agents um, to capture continuous, often theory-driven um, evolution within those agents. So within a given agent embedded in a population, for example, uh, might be a theory-driven representation of their immune function, or perhaps it's of their um, weight metabolism, reflecting the, the tremendous work done by uh, Kevin Hall at the NIH. So each individual might be linked up into social networks, uh, as an agent, but within that individual, we might represent their weight and body composition dynamics, uh, reflecting their um, their dietary intake and their physical activity, as well as aspects of their basal um, metabolism. Um, this is a, a tremendously powerful technique for capturing the inter agent effects, say shaping weight nor weight norms. Uh, relating to uh, levels of physical activity or you know, how my diet is affected by those uh, in my social network, perhaps especially my, my family when I'm young. Um, 
and and we can capture the continuous dynamics in a really uh, uh, deep way uh, within an individual based on theory-driven models. Is this an approach that um, I pursued with my um, uh, great student Dave Vickers um, eight, uh, eight, eight or more years ago um, for uh, immunoepidemiological modeling, but extends across a wide variety of techniques. For example, we might represent pathogen reservoirs within uh, agents representing uh, workplaces and, and homes. Um, where those pathogen reservoirs um, can infect a given agent in the population and are in turn uh, shaped by shedding from agents. They might be reservoirs associated with patches of land for prion-based disease, such as chronic wasting disease, um, in a way that allows that buildup of that reservoir, the dynamics of that reservoir to be shaped by, um, um, by other agents circulating. In other cases, we've had spatial patches where the dynamics of that patch are reflective of environmental dynamics, say here, associated with mosquito and bird populations within that particular patch. Migration between these agents, um, which represent patches, can be captured uh, very readily uh, using the uh, stock and flow models, um, but the agents capture the, um, the connectivity. In other cases, we've had uh, agent driving aggregate system dynamics. In this case, we have high level dynamics, um, which are captured uh, using stock and flow models. Um, <clears throat> but where certain key flows, for example, are, are shaped critically by, um, by the behavior of agents. Um, Perhaps it's um, uh, companies representing uh, adverse corporate actors, such as um, uh, big, uh, big food, big tobacco, um, and shaping the, um, the uh, risk factors within the population, behavioral risk factors. Uh, and we simulate um, these agents at an individual level. In other cases, these are broader population, and, and what we're actually characterizing is things like um, quality adjusted life years lived, uh, buildup of costs, but thus discounted and un undiscounted um, in a way that allows us to, to compute uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratios at the high level. Very compelling pattern. A final um, sort of uh, type of modeling that I'll be talking about um, is, is a situation where we have aggregate system dynamics modeling driving um, agent population evolution. So here we have um, system dynamics modeling, uh, which which shapes um, shapes uh, agents. So for example, there may be um, environmental dynamics associated with, um, uh, say, a stock of mosquitoes, infected mosquitoes, which ends up affecting uh, individual agents whose whose risk behavior, whose geographic location whose social networks, governing social norms, um, whose history of exposure, we're interested in capturing, hence um, individuating them. Um, so we have these high level uh, dynamics uh, of the environment captured with stocks and flows and agents, um, uh, agents risk of infection, uh, risk of exposure, um, uh, agents uh, choice sets, are shaped by the dynamics of this overall environment. Um, so we might have pathogen reservoirs that end up uh, affecting particular agents and particular individuals within the population. Okay, um, so for those of you who are interested in a very high level uh, characterization, I've sort of uh, given it, what I'm going to do now is to go into each of these in a little bit more, more depth. I'm, I'm, I don't have time in this presentation to show how each of these types of hybrid models are built. In fact, it's, it's, these are quite readily done. It's part of my uh, boot camps. I routinely build multiple of these techniques, of, of these approaches, um, sometimes uh, perhaps in a boot camp, all of them, um, for some that are, that are planned. And um, very readily done. Any one of these techniques can be built um, at the most in a few hours, sometimes within um, well less than an hour. 
Um, we don't have time to do that here, unfortunately. Um, the step-by-step -step building you'll find in, in videos um, in my hybrid modeling playlist. Um, however, I did want to talk in a little bit more texture about um, some, of the, some of the advantages of each of these techniques. So if you want to learn a bit more, you're not fully convinced, you might want to watch this section. So let's go back to this to this first one here, this, this service population interaction. You recall here that we have a sort of a catchment region of a given service facility, or, or many service facilities of different sorts. Um, and we're, we're seeking to understand the coupled dynamics of, of individuals in the population, um, their health, um, behavioral risk factors, et cetera, dynamics, and um, the dynamics associated with, a, with that service facility, perhaps in terms of um, um, the level of resource usage, the waiting times, um, the, uh, the patient mix that's seen, um, uh, the, the key performance indicators uh, for that facility in terms of value, et cetera. Um, the real compelling advantages here are, are the ability to, to capture, um, neatly capture resource constrained processes within the service facility in a way that ripples through to affecting the population. Something I didn't emphasize earlier is that uh, within flowing through the service facility, a given agent, again, remaining in the population but flowing simultaneously through this care pathways, a given agent will typically um, experience uh, outcomes. Um, so that agent may have uh, treatment uh, offered to them, which affects their their uh, health state in the population. They may have um, behavioral counseling, which is delivered to them, which affects the behavioral risk factors associated with that agent. And uh, we can capture the flow of these agents in this service facility in a really rich way that allows us to understand the ways in which resource availability affects that um, conferring of, of treatment, of counseling, et cetera. Um, but by the same token, though, we can capture agent-agent interactions and agent-environment interactions in a way that's much richer than what we normally are used to in discrete event modeling. We can place these agents in networks. We can place them in GIS space. We can have them um, interact with with uh, that environment by by uh, shedding a pathogen. We can uh, understand the ways in which their um, norms are shaped by those uh, around them uh, in their home environment outside the context of a facility. We can understand how their care-seeking behavior is affected by care-seeking behavior norms within their network by aspects of trust, et cetera. So we get sort of the best of both worlds. We get this uh, this capacity of of, of having um, uh, resource constrained processing of agents, but at the same time having these agent agent interactions, and the result is is tremendously powerful because we can understand the coupling of them, how innovations in the service delivery, how availability of resources, nurses, uh, procedure rooms, diagnostic equipment ends up rippling through to the population health. We can also understand how population health patterns uh, associated with uh, access to care, et cetera, end up affecting um, the, uh, the patient mix, the level of time offered. We could, for example, investigate how a, uh, the introduction of behavioral counseling within a facility or with, as a general standard within facilities might ripple through to, um, to, to improve population health and thereby actually improve the throughput at that facility, even though on a per case basis, um, giving behavioral counseling takes more time for a given patient because we're nudging or, or shifting the, the health of the whole population um, as a result of, of those we've counseled and the behavioral ripple through effects on norms, we end up actually perhaps having a healthier case mix that ends up presenting in the facility after a couple of years and thereby it's, it's greater throughput. We could see more patients because they're lower risk patients. Very powerful coupling of issues. 
So these, these types of models can answer joint questions involving um, how service types affect presentation of entities, service quality affects representation, how interventions in the population affect service demand and delivery and affect waiting times, et cetera, and how weight affect dynamics of, of health. Why wouldn't we do this in a purely agent-based context? I know there's folks out there are probably purely agent-based models, and you may wonder why do we bolt on this um, this discrete event modeling component? Well, I would argue it's not bolted on. It's actually integral to this model, but it offers a much greater economy, transparency, and crispness of representation. Uh, it's far easier to build and to, to evolve flexibly um, within a discrete event modeling compared to um, representing in an agent-based fashion. Um, representing these service delivery processes, um, these, these well-defined processes of resource-constrained um, processing of, of entities such as patients, is essential to the um, to the enterprise of discrete event modeling, and it's for something for which the 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 library of, of operators of, of of building blocks for discrete event modeling um, is exquisitely well adapted. Um, yes, could you do it in all an agent based modeling? Yes, but it wouldn't be natural. It wouldn't. It would be um, you'd be uh, have, have, be imposing a huge opportunity cost because that would take your time away from other tasks. So, you know, agent-based modeling alone, it's, it's just cumbersome to, to capture the resource dynamics associated with allocation of resources and locking and movement, so for example, around the facility if you wish to capture it, work up, um, queuing effects. It's tedious and it's unnecessary. It's error-prone to try to capture it yourself, roll it yourself in an agent-based modeling. Why not purely in discrete event modeling? Well, discrete event modeling is as I said, exquisite for representing well-defined care processes. It tends not to scale very well for highly flexible processes. Even an entire hospital is going to be hard to represent because of the flexibility of different rules of how different patients are handled and, and the different regions which they can go and different overflow cases. And, and frankly, because also of the tremendous need in some contexts for agent, representing agent-agent interactions, for whether it's transmission of nosocomial infection, build up a pathogen or, or, or whether it's uh, interprofessional coordination. Um, um, it's, it's a great tool for, for simpler processes. Agent-based modeling for representing things out there in the population in agent context, agent history, agent and social networks, agent spatial locations, agent um, uh, preference-informed decision-making based on their situated context. Discrete event modeling is just not going to be the right tool. It is going to be unnatural to apply in that. Discrete event modeling um, has its place, and and uh, using it for its natural component, using uh, agent-based modeling for its natural component, yields a situation where the whole is greater than some of its parts. Now, those who follow my modeling library will note that there's a wide variety of models that I've provided. Um, some with just two of those methods. Um, one that I present in my boot camps, although it's not publicly available, is, is a um, research model, uh, the Beifang Ren model, um, which is a tripartite model. It involves uh, agent-based and, and discrete event modeling, just as we've seen, but also that this next pattern, which where we have this, what I call a budding model. In this case, we have this sort of um, focal view of, of uh, subgroups of the population that are at uh, latest risk, or excuse me, at, at greatest risk, and um, uh, other elements of the population are represented at, at low risk. So here we have, um, uh, we have this population here, you'll recall upstream, say, who are, who are um, important for the dynamics of a model, but are, are not really the focus of our investigation. And then we have this downstream population, this agent population, where um, uh, we, we capture individuals at a very detailed uh, level. And I talked at a, at a high level about this, um, uh, you know, the, the, the virtues that comes from individuating for capturing those, those unique features, which I've enumerated now many, many times. Um, uh, 
this approach is, is particularly valuable because of the lower computational burden and therefore the faster experimentation, speedier learning, speedier insight, speedier model evolution that can come about. We don't need to go into all the detail, all the data sources needed to represent the broader population at an individual level. Instead, we can focus our energies, our time, our insight into um, to representing uh, that level of detail for the population of greatest interest and simulate the rest of the population in a far, far more efficient way. Uh, it affords a um, really tighter uh, focus uh, for our work. So, you know, within this context, um, we have these different methods. Why not each alone? I mean, why not system dynamics alone? Um, as many, many uh, viewers may note, I've published many pure system dynamics models. Why not, why not use that as our sole vehicle, for example? Well, um, system dynamics is a fantastic technique. It's extremely valuable, and um, it is in no way you know, replaced uh, by other techniques or subsumed by them. Uh, but it, it, it affords this coarse resolution when applied at an aggregate model. And I would note this aggregate um, uh, qualifier here. Um, for for health, so if we want, if we need to capture interagent interactions mediated via um, one or more types of networks um, for transmission of norms, if we want to understand the situated context, how the situated context of a patient affects their choice sets and their their decisions as a result, if we want to understand how it affects their 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 norms based on their particular social network, how their social capital and and, not, and, and the knowledge available in their network affects their care-seeking behavior, affects their, their choices and, and, and educational trajectories. Um, uh, capturing this sort of localized context uh, spatially and geographically um, for situated resources and, and topologically in networks can be very, very, invalu uh, very, very um, important. If we want to capture aspects of their history, um, uh, how, how their past exposure, again, early life insults to which they were subjected, um, affects them. If we want to capture uh, the effects of, of earlier episodes of care on their decision making. Um, doing so in an aggregate level, it's just not the right tool. It's unnatural. It is, um, uh, it, it can be force fit into this um, in an awkward, um, a contortionist fashion. Uh, in some cases, by um, approximated by by stratification of a model, but it's really a blunt instrument. Um, stratification of a model, say um, by birth weight, it's going it's it's going to force everything into discrete categories. You're going to and typically to keep the model size manageable, a smaller number of discrete categories, and the number of those categories across the model go up ex geometrically as the number of dimensions of heterogeneity go up. To capture episodes, past episodes of care and their influence, uh, the effects of, of early life experience, um, uh, in as much as it might affect um, uh, individual behavioral risk factors later in life or, or even health, this is it's just going to be profoundly hard. It's just not going to be a natural vehicle. So we have really poor scalability, and I have papers on this for those who are interested in looking at them, but for heterogeneity in general, for comorbidities, for example, as well. Um, why not pure agent-based modeling? Why not have one type of modeling to rule them all? Well, um, as a uh, as a uh, very enthusiastic agent-based modeler as well, uh, I can tell you, um, let's temper our our aspirations with a bit of reality here. Um, agent-based modeling tends to be computationally expensive, and and it's a burden worth paying for certain contexts because of the the, the wonderful insights that can come from individual-based models, but it um, we have to be uh, we have to pick our battles carefully. Um, if if we uh, use it for everything, we're going to be short. We're going to be lengthening our lear learning loop, distending it. We're not going to learn nearly as quickly. Um, we're going to spend a lot more time characterizing areas of the model that really are not central to our interest. And that imposes an opportunity cost. It's going to take our time away from learning from those key portions of our model. It's going to be slower to build. The skill set for agent-based modeling is just 
much less um, much less uh, widely available um, uh, in terms of, of um, what's needed to build those models. That strong computational background as well, um, and and frankly, we'll end up pursuing a lot of a lot of work and potentially some speculative avenues to represent things for the for the upstream population at an at an uh, a, an over a, a very detailed uh, detailed level. So um, in short, uh, agent based modeling is also a um, uh, sort of not a tool that we'd want to use for the entire model. Okay, so um, just to sort of spice the presentation up a little bit and to uh, give an, a, an added understanding or appreciation for each of these sorts of modeling, I'm going to switch over right now to uh, to uh, our preferred package, any logic here, um, which we use to pursue our uh, hybrid modeling approaches. Um, there are others, but we find this one um, uh, particularly uh, compelling in its uh, support for all three types and weaving them together. Um, the first approach I'm going to uh, just uh, uh, present is, is this uh, approach of, of um, uh, situations where the service and population interaction here. So uh, within this context, we have uh, several uh, service facilities here, and we have individuals here who are represented in, in being either a, um, a healthy state or a state which um, in which they're ill. This is an extremely simplistic model, but it it shows this um, transit to care and this uh, care for the population, um, uh, the ways in which the t care conferred ends up affecting people's uh, health state. So when an individual uh, becomes ill, they have a higher likelihood of presenting for care. Uh, once they're under care, uh, based on a pathway, um, a clinical care pathway, um, which they flow through and be treated, the treatment will either be successful or not successful. Uh, if successful, they will be um, they will then uh, undergo a, a state transition to a um, uh, to a state where they are uh, where they're uh, they're again healthy. So here we have individuals within this population presenting for care. You can see one there and going back, for example, so-called cured. Forgive the the slightly humorous sort of um, term, simplistic terminology here. Um, in other cases, individuals may present for care and may um, may not have care uh, uh, care deliver um, a, a complete cure for their health condition, and they go back in a way that uh, leaves them subject to uh, easy representation. So they'll go back and um, and remain ill. And therefore, remain more likely to um, uh, to represent. So here we have this population um, uh, with its uh, coupled uh, coupled uh, clinics. The dynamics of each are uh, are coupled together. And uh, in addition to looking at those individuals, we could go here's a person who returned, for example, ill, um, and they'll end up representing quite quite quickly. Uh, this person. Um, down here, I'd expect within the fairly near future they're going to be um, coming up again. Let's go look at at the uh, clinical care context. For each of these clinics, we have a representation of the flow of patients. Um, patients may bulk if they're waiting too long. There's a limited number of resources in terms of healthcare workers, which at this point are sort of underutilized here, um, uh, utilized about 4% of the time. Um, and uh, the the flow of, of these individuals who do present is is mediated by that um, by the availability of resources. Um, so um, here we go, I'm coming up again for treatment, and now that person is is cured. Okay, so this is the um, the first of those uh, approaches that I mentioned that I think is really compelling. This inter this uh, coupled uh, clinical care delivery on the one hand and population health. Um, 
we could clearly go into interventions there. And if you go and look um, online, you may find uh, uh, models uh, or, or videos where I might um, go uh, investigate the um, the effects of interventions. I'm not sure if I have any of those posted yet, but we certainly will um, hope to do so soon. The second approach, uh, you recall, is this kind of budding approach, where you have a population flowing here at an aggregate level. Once they reach a certain level in the risk continuum, they're, they're individuated. And uh, just to show this, again, at a very uh, stylized fashion here, we have a uh, population here non-diabetics, um, once they get diagnosed, they're waiting to be um, created as agents and periodically um, on a very frequent basis it will, it will individuate them as, an, as a diabetic agent, um, uh, after which point we could follow them longitudinally. So over time here we have a thousand initial people that are flowing down and we're turning people into agents which can be knitted to networks, one um, uh, Lend geographic position according to historical records for diabetics, um, uh, placed associated with uh, uh, to prepare them to record episodes of care or or self care um, or self care um, uh, management, um, uh, and uh, allow us to investigate that population of diabetics in, in greater uh, with greater uh, precision and interventions upon that group, say targeted interventions, ones that depend on history of care or, um, or um, particular uh, risk factors associated with individuals. We could capture those in greater detail. Okay, um, so uh, the next uh, method that I'd like to talk about is, is a situation where we have, again, system dynamic driving agent evolution. And the idea here is that within each agent, we have this rich theory-based representation of agent dynamics. I cited several examples before, immunological dynamics, whole literature on that. Wonderful work by Nowak and May, uh, work on, on HIV, uh, immunology, uh, dynamics, et cetera. Um, uh, we, we also see it in the um, areas of, of weight change. Um, there's been interesting work on learning curves. Um, so there's many areas where we have sort of theory-driven continuous dynamics that we wish to capture. And um, uh, at the same time, we have this ability uh, to capture uh, discrete components at an agent level together with these uh, continuous, um, continuous components uh, captured with stocks and flows. And we can place these people within... Um, uh, with all the benefits that agent agenthood brings or individual level representation. Um, so for example, we can um, look at the the impact um, uh, of having heterogeneity uh, in individuals level of immunocompetence on the epidemiology of infection without hard coding how it affects say a recovery time or how it affects likelihood of infection or, or how it affects likelihood of, of, of a fatal um, level of viremia. Instead, this can be emergent features of simulating the dynamics um, given different levels of immunocompetence, and we've done that in some of our papers. Um, uh, we could examine the coevolution, for example, of weight and weight norms with exposures within an agent network context to weight norms rippling through to uh, individual weight dynamics through effects on um, uh, say, um, uh, physical activity, sedentary behavior, and uh, dietary intake. And we can look at, uh, for, for example, coevolution of pathogen reservoirs and the health of individuals um, circulating in that population. So um, um, here we might have a given facility, for example, associated with a pathogen reservoir, characterized as a stock and flow representation where there's some shedding going on by agents who work or, or live in that facility um, who are ill, who build up pathogens through shedding. And then there's some decay over time through cleaning processes, natural um, decay of, 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 of the, um, the pathogen itself, et cetera, um, due to breakdown. And um, uh, here we, we again have theory-driven representation within a given agent, uh, say in a, in a patch, we might have theory-driven dynamic concerning the interaction of birds and mosquitoes um, in, a, in a rich fashion. Why not each method alone? I mean, why not approach this purely in an agent-based way? I mean, 
you have patches as agents, let's, let's have birds as agents and mosquitoes as agents. Well, you can do that and for certain representations if it's central to your, um, to your research questions, um, that might be a suitable thing. If you're investigating, like some researchers that I've met, um, you know, how uh, mosquitoes des decide uh, where to place their eggs in, in um, uh, water bodies, um, want to understand the impact of, of um, mosquito uh, population size on, on availability of, of good egg sites. Um, you might represent mosquitoes on an individual based level. But, um, in general, uh, often the, the theory is, 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 is limited there, the data is, is limited, and uh, an aggregate representation may be perfectly suitable for our needs, given that our needs perhaps are on the human health side, exposure, say, to West Nile virus, um, to dengue fever, or to malaria. So um, agent-based modeling, um, you know, we could try to capture continuous dynamics within an agent-based model, um, using uh, variables, but it's, it, it lacks conciseness, lacks transparency. The theory isn't obvious. It's captured in, in code. Um, and saying this as a software engineer, I, certainly code is just going to be much less transparent, much more opaque to your stakeholders, the vast majority of stakeholders. Um, and, and in general, uh, stocks and flows um, are just going to have a, a much crisper, a more transparent, and more robust representation um, that's going to be more accessible to stakeholders. Why not just represent everything in system dynamics? I mean, why why have um, agents at all? Well, we've gone over this in, earlier in the presentation. And again, I can run down the list, uh, needing to capture agent history, needing to capture agent heterogeneity, which is central to issues of health disparities uh, and, and, and differential uh, decision-making among agents, needing to have, capture changing choice choice sets associated with spatial uh, position um, within, a now, uh, within a geographic space, uh, capturing effects through uh, social networks, um, transmission of norms, attitudes, uh, knowledge, beliefs uh, involving health. Um, uh, if we want to represent detailed interventions that depend on any of those things, so we were to calibrate against that data, an aggregate system dynamics model is going to be it's, it's, it's just not going to be a, a particularly, it's going to be a blunt instrument for representing uh, a lot of those. Um, and stratification there is an unsustainable answer beyond a, a certain point. It's just not going to be a, 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 a practical strategy for capturing beyond a certain basic level of heterogeneity. System dynamics models also have very limited a sort of poor ability to express uh, discrete dynamics. You can do it and force fit it, but it's somewhat unnatural to represent, say, the different dynamics associated with um, uh, with a, a remarkable transition, like the birth of an infant or, or associated with a death um, in a way that fundamentally alters the relevant equations, et cetera. It's very handy, as we know from the hybrid um, uh, automata literature, wonderful work done at Berkeley um, and elsewhere. Uh, it's very handy to have different sets of differential equations that apply in different contexts. And it's difficult to do that with classic system dynamics. <coughs> with a hybrid model, we can actually do quite well with a bit of trick. Um, it's a very, very simple and very, rather elegant um, ways of representing it. So system dynamics by itself, poor sort of uh, capturing um, of spatial context, network context, particularly um, uh, history, uh, and um, and we can do a lot by combining both. We get something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Quite a few models I've provided for free um, uh, support this, and I'd encourage you to look at them. We'll go uh, take a look at um, just a few right now. Um, one would be this this model that dates back what eight 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 to nine years now, I think, um, uh, which uh, we published um, in a page of, of, of several journals and different views of it. Excuse me, yeah, I didn't mean to run that scenario. I meant to run the, this, uh, this one. Here we have individuals, they're placed in networks, and uh, each individual here um, is, is characterized as, as being in a state, either living or dead, 
and uh, they have uh, viral dynamics characterized by, according to a model by uh, um, Waters, um, Nowak, and I think May, um, Robert May was uh, involved, the esteemed modeler um, from the UK as well. And so we have um, each individual having three variants, a uh, number of uninfected cells, infected cells, and uh, sort of an aggregate stock representing activated um, T cells. Um, and um, without going into it, there's an activation of, of, of uh, immunity based on uh, infection, and um, uh, the level of free variance infects, uh, ends up infecting cells. So within this context, each of these individuals in the network evolves according to these um, state equations, according to this system dynamics model. Um, and uh, if we if we go look, well, you have a, a single index individual starts out. Um, I believe the the redness is the, the relative level of, of free virus within that individual. The width of the radius of the uh, circle is reflective of uh, their level of um, of uh, uh, immune activation. And we see this infection propagating through the network. Um, a given individual here. Uh, can be followed, uh, for example, um, uh, over time in a longitudinal fashion. Uh, and what we'll generally see is, is uh, some cycling associated with uh, successive um, infections as conferred by their neighbors. So uh, there's variance from a neighbor, I should have mentioned, flowing in here. And so we get this uh, infection spreading across the network, and there's uh, actually heterogeneity here in level of immunocompetence, and it leads to certain individuals being uh, harder hit than others. But more, more interestingly, showing the, uh, the advantages of this context, we can go to a situation where there's actually only a, a moderate level of, of free variants needed, uh, of viremia needed to, 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 to kill a person. So someone who has a weakened immune um, response may be, in fact, at risk uh, for their life. Recall that each individual here within the population can be either living or dead, and when they're dead, they're, they disappear from the network. So here we see the spread of infection as before in the network. Um, but some individuals end up uh, dying from the infection and, and disappear from the network. And that ends up affecting the sort of reverberation of infection uh, around this network. Um, this is a selection effect that, that shapes the dynamics for other individuals. So here we have discrete dynamics. We have um, continuous dynamics, discrete dynamics captured through a state chart that we saw. We have discrete dynamics, excuse me, continuous dynamics captured through uh, stocks and flows. Um, another case would be where we have this um, uh, population. I showed a a graph of this, uh, or a picture, oh, I don't want that one, that's way too, uh, um, that's way too crowded for our needs here. Um, uh, so here we go. We have individuals in the population. Um, the individuals live in homes, and during the day, they, they proceed to, um, uh, and proceed to workplaces. We can speed this up a bit. Um, and some of these individuals are initially infected. They can spread to each other, but um, they also shed a uh, virus within the workplaces. So there's a, a shedding rate that builds up a pathogen reservoir within a given uh, facility. And as running this on, you'll see that that pathogen reservoir evolves as um, growing numbers of individuals who are, who are ill come to it. So you get this build up of pathogen reservoir at the level of particular facilities as well as at the level of, of homes. Um, an individual uh, sheds while in the home, an individual may bring back infection from their, from their workplace. So here we have, for example, a particular population member. They're in, in one of these three states, shedding being infectious, and they're, they're either at home or, or at work. Uh, so once again here, we have this situation where we have um, these sort of coupled dynamics of pathogen reservoirs on the one hand and individual dynamics on the other. And we could examine the effects of a wider variety of interventions that result from that. So for example, we could, we could intervene upon an individual, uh, lower their rates of, of, of um, their, their, hy improve their hygiene to make them 
uh, less subject to infection here, can enhance the, it could shorten the time to recovery, perhaps by treatment with antivirals or through screening. Um, but then at the level of, of a uh, facility, for example, we can implement cleaning or disinfection mechanisms or, or uh, perhaps even better seed uh, um, uh, probiotic, uh, better bacteria within this, uh, within this facility. Um, that would compete the, um, with, with the adverse bacteria. So here we can, by coupling these models, we can capture, um, we can capture these benefits that, that um, uh, are conferred at the level of sort of this continuous dynamics, the, the agent dynamics, at the level of the environmental contamination or at the level of, of the individual progression. Um, other representations, uh, too, um, I think uh, I'll go light in it other than to say that some of our chronic disease modeling um, also has uh, individuals knit into networks where um, there's evolution of norms. So here relation uh, connect together and people are knit into family networks as well as social networks. And uh, within this population, um, people's uh, diabetic state status evolves uh, as affected by uh, risk factors, including their current weight, uh, their birth weight um, when they were born, uh, whether they're exposed in utero. Um, but another effect on their current weight is shaped by their physical activity level. And their physical activity level is shaped by the physical activity level uh, of those uh, around them. So um, their physical activity is, is going to be evolving according to, um, to those who surround them. And uh, again, a, a, uh, capturing things in this sort of way affords us a chance to, to examine the impact of interventions, targeted or a broader base, population-wide, at, 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 um, at different points in the system. We can examine the effects of, of um, peer educators or, or, or providing social support or, or um, enhancing uh, physical activity in one area of the population, seeing how it ripples through to other. Others, we might also put into place screening mechanisms for pre-diabetics or, or look at um, improved um, uh, nutrition that might uh, lower the risk of, of presentation with, um, with overweight or indeed with obesity. Um, by, by endogenizing certain features here, like uh, physical activity, we can therefore open up avenues for us to investigate additional, um, additional features. Um, now, in this um, this next model, we're going to be looking at models where we have a situation where there's an agent population driving high-level continuous dynamics. So, for example, we have a bunch of, um, of individuals who then, uh, say, companies in competition or colluding as far as um, pro-tobacco mar um, marketing, and, and they end up affecting the, um, the behavior safe and of an aggregate population. Um, uh, so why would, why would we, um, let's, let's take a look at a, a model like this. Um, one model is, for example, a classic one is a, is a health economics model. In this case, the aggregate quantities are, are particularly familiar. In this model, we have, um, we have individuals. Uh, or represented as having a very stylized and simple representation associated with uh, progression of diabetes and diabetic complications. But those individuals um, are, are having statistics on them involving, um, I think in this case we have both uh, cost and quality of life of being in various uh, states. And that ends up affecting the, um, uh, the accumulation of quality adjusted life years um, across the population, of course, life years um, being reflective as the integral of the population over time, uh, just totaling up the number of pop people in the population and, uh, over, over time, conceptually it's an integral um, in continuous time. Uh, we also have costs um, uh, captured through activity-based um, costing, for example, uh, episodic costs associated with transplants, operation then costs per, um, Per, for being in a state, state-based cost for, you say, being a diabetic or, or being on dialysis while in end-stage renal disease. And these accumulated costs, um, 
there are also intervention costs that we can uh, simulate. And so running this over time with these high-level um, high level measures, which are um, accumulating uh, the stocks and flows, information about this population below. In this case, it's a one-way link, but we could easily imagine cases where costs end up rippling through to the care conferred, for example, which would affect, in turn, individual evolution. Um, so uh, what, are we, um, what are we seeing in this case? Um, we're seeing this combination of system dynamics and, and agent-based modeling, uh, very powerful. Um, uh, why can't we use each in isolation? Why not pure agent-based modeling? Um, why do we need these stocks and flows? Well, um, in some cases, it's a matter of simulating the entire system as agents, um, and rather than you know high level um, only simulate the focal population. The example I gave earlier was uh, with uh, birds and, and mosquitoes, simulating them with stocks and flows. These aggregate stocks and and flows, and and those are. Um, uh, perhaps uh, being affected by um, by uh, evolution of of, of agents, um, uh, uh, the the individual people, uh, perhaps um, exposures to illness on the part of those people motivate mosquito control policies on the part of uh, the health region, for example. Uh, Agent-based modeling provides poor support for the continuous dynamics we'd really like to capture. Could we total up qualities? Life years lived, um, discounted costs, undiscounted costs, using uh, agent-based modeling alone, sure. <laughs> Again, it's not natural. It, the lack of concision, poor transparency, there's a manual need to inf enforce certain conservation uh, properties, and lack of uh, accessibility for stakeholders. It's neat and crisp to represent it with stocks and flows, and quite the opposite when, when we have um, when we have uh, it represented just in terms of variables in code. Transparency is very, very important. If you, in many modeling contexts where you're seeking buy-in by stakeholders um, and um, contributions from those stakeholders, and very importantly, if you're seeking those stakeholders to comment on the model, make suggestions for improvement, you want it to be transparent. Why not do it all in system dynamics? Well, uh, I won't go over it again, but they're absolutely compelling motivations for having people individuated as agents in certain contexts. And the health disparities agents, the health disparities area um, for many needs is key. Uh, aspects of, of, of that motivate life course perspectives, calculating those early life impacts and later life, um, early life exposures and later life trajectories, et cetera. Um, there's just many, many reasons why we might want to represent things at an agent level for certain segments of our population. Um, while system dynamics is a very strong uh, aggregate uh, representation, from the very earliest years of it, um, some of Jay Forrester's early work, he was representing um, a company says conceptually as, as individual constructs um, with stocks and flows associated with each company and looking at competition effects, for example. Um, that's my recollection, and um, and there's you know a good good reason that we might um, re break out those individuals rather than just representing it at, at, at an aggregate level. So we have um, models like this. I've listed one of them. I think uh, we have others uh, as well. Okay, how about this case where aggregate system dynamics uh, drives the agent-based population uh, evolution, where we have um, dynamics at that higher level affecting the agents. Well, the case we just talked about is one of them um, where we have um, mosquito dynamics um, affecting uh, agents, for example, the presence of, of infectious mosquitoes um, infecting, um, infecting individual people who are captured, individuated as agents. So we could capture their multiple exposures to West Nile virus, their geographic position, and the risk factors associated with their mobility patterns uh, within the landscape, for example. Um, we might also uh, characterize um, their uh, care-seeking behavior and norms associated with personal protective uh, behaviors in ways in which that's affected by messaging, for example. Something which might differ strongly from one individual to another 
you know, where certain vulnerable groups might be um, might be um, harder to reach. So capturing that heterogeneity will often motivate an, an agent population. Um, why not represent it uh, purely in an agent-based model? Well, I don't think I need to go into this uh, in nearly as much detail based on the previous representations. Computational burden and poor support and, and then uh, system dynamics uh, uh, alone would be a, a poor match to our needs for agents. Um, uh, the model I showed earlier on environmental contamination, um, you could view as, um, as certainly at the least tightly related to it from the perspective of, of people. So these individual people um, moving around, um, they're being affected by sort of more aggregate dynamics within each workplace associated with buildup of, of pathogen. Uh, I won't I won't debate whether it's an example of one of these patterns or another or both. I think it's arguably both, but um, but uh, here we do have these uh, pathogens which end up affecting uh, individual uh, people, individual population members are in, are in fact infected by their uh, exposure here, um, this risk of environmental um, environmental infection. So um, within this context, uh, we do have a situation where we have people exposed to this, um, you could argue it's, it's higher level environmental dynamics captured with stocks and flows um, in their current exposure level based on, on their current position as captured. Um, so some concluding remarks. You stayed with this for a long time and, I'm, and I, I welcome your attention and, and I think it's really admirable if you've made it this far. A couple of concluding remarks I'll try to keep brief. Hybrid system science uh, models offer diverse benefits that exceed, and, and frankly, I think exceed the sum of those of, of, of the, the methods out of which they're composed. I mean, um, it certainly exceeds those, those, the benefits of any one method. Um, being an extensive practitioner of, of several methods, I can tell you that um, that um, my investigatory lens would be um, greatly crimped, would be really compromised if I didn't have these multiple methods I could weave together in this way. Um, a key benefit of these models, these hybrid models, is the capacity to readily evolve the boundary of the model. What's in scope, out of scope? What's endogenously captured? What's exogenously captured with learning that goes on? You're going to want to learn, alter it, your process about what you need to represent. You want to be able to have recourse to a more detailed representation for certain regions when you need it. Um, particular subsets of system science methods can be configured in diverse ways to speak to research context. It's not like agent-based modeling and system dynamics being combined. There's one way to do it. No, in fact, there's multiple configurations. We've seen it. Agents, you know, uh, system dynamics within agents. Agents contributing to system dynamics laterally, system dynamics budding off, um, the flows from system dynamics budding off agents. So diverse ways to speak to different research needs, different research questions, different modeling needs. And it will behoove you to think about it more flexibly. Um, you know, select your modeling methods according to needs of, of different um, subdomains of your research questions, the purpose of your model. Um, it's not one size fits all. Don't don't take that hammer and use it for every problem. Try to craft your uh, solution to the problem in a way that reflects um, really what's what's needed to answer your questions, and um, be be parsimonious if you don't need that very detailed representation. Um, if you if you don't think you need it yet, go lighter. Um, it will save you the opportunity cost of representing it up front learn and incrementally evolve that model. Start very, very simple and incrementally evolve it as your learning shapes your understanding of what's needed rather than planning for one true great big model towards which you just work. And uh, finally, and this is based on, on um, some, some uh, crosstalk I've seen in the, in the uh, modeling field, to really understand the advantages and the trade-offs of hybrid modeling. To really understand what does it buy you and what are the costs of pursuing it, speak to those who are really experienced in applying it. Um, those who have who have built um, 
uh, dozen or more um, hybrid models um, can speak with authenticity to the um, to, to what it, what it gives you and how it compares to uh, any technique. And particularly um, if you're talking to uh, to individuals who may be uh, partisan in, in one technique, you're going to want to be very cautious of of, interp of taking their their comments on it. Speak to those who are open minded about different techniques and have applied them in tandem in a coupled way to answer research questions. It's my honor to have had you here through this presentation. Thank you very much for your patience, and I hope this has conferred some value to your understanding. Um, I hope to contribute additional um, uh, videos, but you'll find dozens of videos on other aspects of hybrid modeling um, uh, online, and I guess I should mention one um, one important event. We are having an agent-based uh, and hybrid modeling boot camp for health researchers uh, this August uh, 2015. Um, it provides detailed hands-on coverage to building, calibrating, and using agent-based and diverse hybrid models. Hybrid models will be an important emphasis this year. Um, um, we have a um, diverse and, uh, and, and uh, powerful set of, of uh, staff who are helping out with this, um, uh, teaching assistants for whose support I'm, I'm grateful, who will be providing um, assistance along with me for conceptualizing crafting models. Um, this is a boot camp and incubator, um, and uh, it's an event that's designed to help participants uh, adapt what they're learning to their particular research areas. Um, and uh, it's great to get started on modeling project and, and to go through the, the initial steps of it um, when you're confronting and grappling with your particular challenges with that instructor, myself, around, and with other, um, with the TAs around who have collectively an amazing amount of, of experience in different areas. Uh, so I'd like to invite you, um, and uh, the um, location of it is there. Uh, feel free to write with uh, write to me if you'd like. Um, uh, but uh, you can find a fair bit of information online. The registration is open um, as of uh, as of May. So thank you so much um, for your attention, and uh, hope to see you for a future video. Take care. Bye bye.